Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, first of all, I must, of course, apologize uh, for my woeful inability to uh, speak Spanish and for an Englishman to come to Spain and not even to manage a few words I know is a very poor show and I must apologize for that. But thank you very much and to thank the friends uh, of the Prado Museum for so uh, generously and I may say flatteringly inviting me to come and speak here um, at one of the great art locations um, in the world. Um, of course, the Prado Museum has for a very long time been one of the world's great collections. Um, but I think, to my judgment, it's only over the last 10 or 15 years that it's become one of the great museums in terms of the way it communicates with its public, the services it provides, the means by which uh, it brings its great art collections to public attention. Um, and as I'm sure you already know, uh, it is admired uh, from around the world. So it is a great privilege for me to be here. Uh, and somewhat strange, perhaps, for me to be speaking in such a major international institution about my own organization, uh, the Art Fund, uh, previously called the National Art Collections Fund, which is a very small organization indeed in many respects. We have only 40 staff members, but we have been operating um, in uh, Britain for uh, just over 100 years, for 110 years in fact. Uh, and this afternoon I'm going to, a little self-indulgently I fear, speak principally about the Art Fund, my organization, and what it's done over 100 years and some of the challenges that it's faced. Um, and I understand a little about the context in which this lecture sits, the, the, the course that you are all undertaking, looking at different kinds uh, of, of patronage for the arts. And I, all I can hope is that the example that I talk about, about my institution, may have some relevance, may have some uh, possible application on other stages uh, in the world in, in the years to come. Um, I believe I'm right in saying the Art Fund is the only institution of its kind. And I need to tell you before I go any further, I think, exactly what we do in essence. Uh, we are a grant-giving body. We give grants of money to museums around uh, the whole of the United Kingdom uh, to enable them to buy works of art. Usually we give a contribution to the cost of a work of art. So a museum will come to us and ask for a million, or a, a, let's say a million pounds towards a picture that costs 10 million pounds, or perhaps more, usually 10,000 pounds towards a picture that costs 100,000 pounds. And we are therefore one of a series of sources of funding. Some come from the state, some come from private individuals. But one of a, a series of sources of funding that make up every acquisition of a work of art in a, in a UK museum today. Uh, and what is unique about us is that our money comes not from any government source, but it comes solely from individuals. We are now supported by nearly 100,000 members, subscribers if you like, people who pay about uh, 80 or 90 euros per year to belong to the art fund and that creates a fund of five or six million pounds which we have to give away every year to museums. So those 100,000 subscribers are effectively uh, uh, art patrons. They are providing the means by which museums are able to develop their collections. They don't do so entirely disinterestedly, and I will talk a little bit about this later on, they join the Art Fund because we, with the collaboration of the museums, give them benefits and privileges in, in return. And it's that formula of mutual support, really, that I want to examine today. I'm going to do four things. Um, firstly, to tell you a little bit about the history of the Art Fund and to give you some examples of some of the works of art we've bought. And I will, I've got a lot of slides, but I will move very fast through them, so don't blink, otherwise you will, you will miss them. Um, Secondly, I'm going to look at some of the developments of the relatively recent past where a certain tension has arisen between the, um, the collecting ambitions of museums, particularly in the contemporary field, 
uh, and some of the more traditional views held by members and supporters of the Art Fund and how we as an organisation negotiate that occasional difference of opinion. Um, and thirdly, I'm going to look at the, at the phenomenon of what one might call uh, visitor power, people power, uh, the opinions of uh, museum, the museum going public about what kind of art they want to see on the walls, what kind of exhibitions uh, they want uh, museum people to, to organise. And the dilemma of the Art Fund in how far we should react to those uh, pressures and how much uh, we should be proactive and to provide leadership uh, on our own terms. Uh, and finally, I'm going to look a little bit um, at the end um, about some of the methods that we've used in recent years to uh, raise more money and to uh, attract more support, because that, in the end, is what we're there to do. Um, so, the phrase mobilising mass philanthropy, I've no idea uh, what the Spanish translation of that might be, but it's a, it's a complicated way of saying the job of the art fund is to mobilise, to uh, make active uh, the wishes of large numbers of people who wish to help uh, museums in their quest to develop better collections of works of art. Um, the art fund... Um, the idea of the Art Fund began really, I think, in the 1880s in Britain, and perhaps, actually, that's a slightly distracting slide, so I'm going to go back to the, the text slide. The idea began in the 1880s, a period in Britain of agricultural depression, which was putting great pressure on some of the great landed estates in the UK, country house collections of art, the, the, you know, the mainstay of British heritage, were becoming increasingly under threat, aristocrats in Britain were having to sell off major works of art in order to keep the economies of their uh, land holdings secure. And there were a series of uh, collectors in Germany, in France, uh, and particularly in America as the late 19th century developed that began to be seen as rather uh, voracious, um, swooping on the, the heritage of Britain as uh, cash-strapped aristocrats made their collections available to, in the sale room or through the picture dealer. And there began to be a bit of discussion in the press um, around the turn of the century about what could be done to correct this phenomenon. And I think not very far beneath the surface there was patriotism, for sure, but also a kind of xenophobia, a, a fear of, of uh, uh, foreign intervention in the culture of Britain, this idea that that foreign uh, powers would seize the great uh, art treasures of Great Britain. Uh, and the idea of trying to mobilise um, the people of Britain ar around the idea of stopping this, almost the kind of army of art lovers who would do something to prevent this drain of great works of art. That idea uh, began to develop. Um, and in, in 1903... Uh, it finally uh, led to the formation of an organisation called the National Art Collections Fund with half a dozen um, uh, players, if you like, in the art world. I won't bother to give you their names, but they you know, were representatives of some of the major galleries. They were one or two amateur collectors, uh, people who believed that their uh, role in life was to lead this, uh, the, the uh, formation of this new organisation. And above all... Uh, and one of their members, Roger Fry, quite a famous uh, art critic and curator, he believed, above all, that it should be about an alliance between a small number of wealthy people uh, and a much, much wider group of supporters around the country. And so from the word go, the idea of it being a mass movement was ingrained in its, uh, uh, in its psyche. Um, and indeed, the annual level of subscription... The, the, the level at which, you know, the, the amount of money you were asked to pay to join this organisation was set at uh, one guinea or one pound or, you know, one pound 18 euros. Um, uh, so a relatively low level um, and an alliance, as I say, between, between wealthy figures in the art fund and, and the wider public uh, was the, the principal idea. And one of the earliest um, significant acquisitions that was made uh, was this uh, nocturne by Whistler, 
uh, for the National Gallery to be uh, assigned subsequently to the newly founded Tate Gallery, which was um, created in 1897 as a sort of offshoot of the National Gallery. And this was actually quite a controversial work in some ways for the National Art Collections Fund to you know, make one of its early moves. It's a picture which, as some of you may know, uh, comes from a series of works, the Nocturnes, which famously involved a court case between the English critic John Ruskin and uh, the painter John uh, Jem W. Whistler, who sued him for libelous, allegedly libelous statements he'd made about the picture. Uh, and by the taste of the early uh, 20th century, or some parts of more conservative taste in the United Kingdom, this was seen to be quite a bold purchase. Uh, and indeed, it was not the last uh, of, of a list, quite a long list of controversial purchases that the the National Art Collections Fund, I'm going to refer to it as the Art Fund, which is its short name, um, made in, in the years to follow. One of the most famous of all early purchases was uh, this work um, by Velasquez, of course, um, uh, uh, acquired by the National Gallery, um, thanks to a complete grant, a 100% grant of £45,000, which was brought together partly through uh, a kind of public appeal. It was a very celebrated uh, case where the picture dealers Agnews had bought the picture um, from Rokeby Hall in Yorkshire, hence the, the name the Rokeby Venus, although the Toilet of Venus is the, is the uh, more correct art historical name. Agnews acquired the picture and found a buyer in America who was prepared to pay, I think it was £60,000, but offered it to the nation for £45,000. So he was a picture dealer making an evidently patriotic gesture and challenging the country to try to raise the money. There was no tradition of uh, government funding in any major uh, sense. And so the, the challenge was, was picked up by the art fund. And uh, there was a lot of public debate about whether this work, again, its subject matter seemed to be quite adventurous, some people found it offensive, there was a debate about the portrayal of female flesh in national institutions and so on. Uh, and so it became quite a celebrated cause. Um, but at the, uh, you know, it looked as if the money was going to be hard to raise and at the last moment, I think the king himself put in from his own pocket 8,000 pounds and the acquisition was made. And the press were full of praise for uh, as they put it, the fund finally uh, justifying its existence with this, uh, with this rather remarkable purchase. Now, uh, that was followed uh, a few years later by another very significant uh, purchase, an extremely important work by Hans Holbein the Younger, also acquired by the, uh, the, the National Gallery. Um, this time, the Art Fund's campaign to try to raise money from the country at large went very slowly indeed, and I think I'm right in saying that of the 72,000 that was required, uh, only 6,000 had been raised by, from the public uh, with the deadline fast approaching. Um, and it was then that uh, an anonymous uh, individual uh, stepped forward. Uh, we only knew and know that she was, it was a woman, and she made a donation on the express condition that her name would never uh, be revealed and would only be known by the chairman and indeed successive chairman of the, of the Art Fund. And one of the traditions that exist to this day is when a new chairman of the Art Fund is appointed, he is handed an envelope which contains the name of the, uh, the anonymous donor who made the purchase of this extraordinary uh, work uh, possible. So a, a small anecdote, if you like, but um, an interesting uh, uh, early indication of how whatever the theory of an alliance between uh, a, a small number of wealthy donors and a large uh, uh, number of the public in a more general support role, whatever the theory of that, in practice, often it's the small group of wealthy donors who, who are called on to, to make the final difference. And I should say here, here's a, um, uh, one of those cartoons that is actually quite difficult to get the point of many years later, but th here we have an, uh, this figure uh, representing uh, America uh, trying to seize, take away the Duchess of Milan, the Holbein pictures, to drag it across the channel. Uh, and the implication is that the art fund was, you know, invited to prevent this monstrous crime um, 
from happening. And certainly it did become quite a celebrated cause in a way that it's a little difficult to imagine becoming the case today. Art causes do uh, get a certain amount of public attention, but one certainly gets the impression that this was a, you know, a, a, the major art story of the day for, for some months. Um, I'm just going to run through very quickly a few more examples of works of art that were acquired in the first sort of half of the century with, with art fund support. This uh, uh, very uh, well-known portrait by the pre-Raphaelite painter uh, John Everett Millet, uh, acquired in the 1920s and today one of the great sort of icons of the Tate's collection. Um, this extremely important um, study for the Sistine Chapel, uh, acquired for the suspiciously small sum of £600. I gather there was a major uh, uncertainty about the attribution, uh, which um, uh, thankfully for the British Museum and the Art Fund had a detrimental effect on the price, and this very uh, uh, excellent and important acquisition uh, was made as a result. Another example, um, uh, different media, um, this great work acquired by the V&A in 1926 with a one-third grant from the Art Fund. Um, the Luttrell Psalter, um, acquired by the British Library. This uh, had a slightly unusual history in terms of its acquisition in that the, um, the British Museum, as it then was, uh, part of the British Library, found it very difficult to raise the funds. The Art Fund had put in all, its, all it could and at the last moment, before the uh, work was due to be exported to an overseas buyer, um, an American, John Pierpont Morgan, who was also a very close friend of the British Museum, made an interest-free loan to the museum to enable that acquisition uh, to be made. So there was an instance of one of the voracious foreigners uh, saving the day on behalf of a great uh, national institution. Um, moving on, another example of a great work um, in the Ashmolean, acquired with a, um, uh, this, I, I think there's a story around this as well, a, uh, a curator who, uh, Kenneth Clark, who moved on to become very famous director of the National Gallery and figure in the art world, when a curator at the Ashmolean uh, saw this work in a private collection and uh, bought it himself for £3,000 um, because he believed that it was about to be bought by an overseas collector, and the art fund reimbursed him, and the work was transferred into the Ashmolean's collection. Uh, at quite another uh, level, a very different kind of work, uh, one of the great so uh, works of African art before European influence uh, had taken hold. Uh, as you can see, a tiny sum of money um, uh, given the almost complete absence of a market for this kind of art um, at that stage in the, in the, in the 20th century. Um, uh, Auguste Rodin's The Kiss, another very well-known work in the Tate's collection. The Art Fund had a role in, in helping the acquisition of that. Um, this wonderful Velasquez in the uh, National Gallery of Scotland. Uh, again, a relatively small contribution you'll see there. Uh, a Stubbs for Manchester. Uh, and I should stress that despite some of my examples, which tend to have been around the London and, and Oxford and Cambridge museums, uh, the Art Fund has always supported the acquisition of work across the country. Um, Britain now has about 600 museums. Um, certainly it would have had two or 300 in the middle of the century. And the Art Fund aimed to support regionally as well as in terms of, um, of, the, of the urban centres. Um, this great Picasso also, again, a relatively small grant, 50,000 out of 1.9 million uh, acquired for the Tate in 1988. Um, overall, in the last uh, 110 years, the grants paid out by the Art Fund, the sums of money raised principally through public subscription through the members, um, have totaled nearly £87 million, pounds, and they have gone to support the purchase of works of art worth £671 million, pounds, and that's across over 11,000 acquisitions. And you can see, I suppose, by doing the maths, that uh, that means, on average, uh, about 15% uh, of the value of every acquisition uh, is provided by an art fund grant. And you might say that is actually a relatively small proportion, and, and indeed it is. But I think there has uh, almost the fact of an art fund grant 
has become more important in the process of making an acquisition than the amount in some instances. Often the art funds trustees, and I should say that decisions about where grants are made or not made, lie in the hands of our 18 expert trustees who provide a kind of spread of, of skill covering everything from Anglo-Saxon coinage right up to the contemporary. Um, but the uh, decisions that they make are often uh, taken as a, a kind of imprimatur, a stamp of approval, which other funders then follow. So a grant from the art fund early on in the process of a fundraising campaign for a work of art can be very influential. And, and our trustees are very happy to, to play that role. Uh, we also um, accept gifts, which quite often come to works, to museums of works of art through the art fund. A collector who wants to make a gesture in support of the art fund will give us the work and ask us to pass it on to a museum, as in the case of this uh, very beautiful right of Derby, acquired by Derby Museum in 1937. Um, and again, in the case of this William Blake, uh, acquired by the Tate in 1949. Um, and the Art Fund is also very frequently involved in bequests, uh, works that people leave in their wills to go to museums after their death. Uh, here's a fine example, um, the John Rylands Library in Manchester acquiring uh, this very important work in 1955 that came uh, from the uh, Cook collection. There is a famous travel agent in English history, Thomas Cook, um, who built up a, an art collection of over 400 works. And uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, his, his son, uh, Ernest Edward Cook, uh, didn't have a strong sense of which museums he wanted the works to go to after his death. And so he entrusted the job of deciding which works went to which museums um, to the art fund. And that was a role we were very happy to play. Um, here's another from that same collection, a Tiepolo going to the Ashmolean. Um, most famously in recent times, um, an extraordinary English collector called Sir Dennis Mann, um, who you may know of, acquired a major, uh, built up a major collection, uh, particularly of Italian Baroque paintings uh, over many, many years. Um, and uh, he built the collection up in many, in many ways with public collections eventually uh, already in mind. So he was buying works for himself that he knew he wanted one day to go into public collections. Um, despite his intimate knowledge of the different museum collections, uh, he nonetheless still wished to involve the art fund in the process of distributing those works after his death. He could have simply assigned them, but he wanted the art fund to play a role in, um, uh, in distributing the works, partly because he wanted the art fund to insist that the museums concerned adhered to certain very specific conditions. He was a man who was passionately uh, opposed to the idea of museums charging a fee for admission and passionately opposed to the idea of museums ever uh, selling works from their own collections. And he asked the art fund to insist in the legal contracts that we made with the museums that they could not charge admission or sell works from their collection without losing uh, those works, without those works being returned to the art fund. And that's a complicated legal challenge that um, we took on after his death in 2011 and completed just earlier this year. And here are two quick examples, beautiful uh, work uh, for the Ashmolean by Romanelli and another by Guercino, uh, also going to the Ashmolean. Uh, and that was really a, a, quite a sort of uh, moment of national significance that we were very pleased indeed to um, be part of. Now, in many senses, the, um, and, and the publicity, I should say, around the moment of that transfer uh, just earlier this year was quite ex extensive. And in many ways, I think uh, it marked for some of the more traditional, long-standing um, uh, members of the Art Fund, it was a moment of some relief because in the year or two previously, uh, and I took over as director in at the beginning of 2010, and I was very interested to understand the feelings of members, the supporters, the people who give us our five million pounds a year, what it was that they thought about the way we were spending their money. And I was becoming increasingly aware of 
a kind of uneasiness about uh, a, a, a reasonably uh, significant number of grants going to support contemporary works of art, whereas the Art Fund had been more traditionally associated, at least in the public mind, with the acquisition of great old master paintings uh, and so on. And I noted that the announcement of the Dennis Mann uh, uh, bequest and the Art Fund's role in distributing it was greeted with relief and almost uh, a sense of sort of triumph by some of our more traditional supporters who felt that the Art Fund was beginning to spend its money in the wrong way. Now, of course, the Art Fund principally is there not to do its own work, to implement its own policies, but to act in support of museums. It's something I feel very strongly about indeed. And it's for museums and museum curators and directors to determine the kind of works that they want to buy. And our role is to be as helpful as we can um, in uh, making those acquisitions successful. Our expert trustees will soon point out if a work is not quite what the curator thinks it is, if there is a problem with the value, or anything like that. But generally speaking, we don't feel it's our role to regulate the uh, flow of contemporary as opposed to historic work into uh, museum collections. Uh, and this has you know, presented us with uh, quite an interesting challenge, I think, as we come to terms with the possibility that the people who are providing the funding are not entirely happy with the way the money is being distributed. Now, it would be quite wrong to say that the Art Fund had never been involved in supporting modern and contemporary art. Indeed, you know, one of the very first works I showed earlier on was of the Whistler, which, you know, in 1905 was a work that was only 30 years old, so it was a a work of modern art in its own right. And here's an example of a, a, of a, of a, a Mondrian acquired by the Tate in 1990, uh, a wonderful Bridget Riley from 1992 acquired for a, a, a regional gallery, uh, Abbott Hall in 97. Uh, this work by Nish Kapoor, Cartwright Hall, uh, 1997. Um, Cindy Sherman, this is a photograph, of course, acquired by the v in 2003 um, and coming closer up to the present day, part of an important uh, collection of photographs by the artist Boris Mikhailov, uh, acquired by the Tate. And uh, I show this last example partly because it was the subject of a, you know, a few letters that I received as director asking me to explain in some detail why the acquisition of, of photographs, uh, and you'll see the grant of £75,000 is not a small grant by anyone's uh, uh, reckoning, asking me to explain why a grant like that was made. And what one or two people suggested at that time was that the Art Fund should focus more squarely, not simply on more traditional works of art, but in works of art where a public appeal was being run in conjunction with the giving of a grant. And by public appeal, uh, as I'm sure you know, I mean the mounting of a campaign to raise more money for the acquisition of that specific work. So the Art Fund will make a grant from the subscriptions that it has from its members, but it will then use the media and other means to encourage large numbers of the public to help make an acquisition possible. And so it was argued that it's in public appeals where the public really gets a chance to vote for what it wants. And if it doesn't like a work of art, um, it simply won't come up with the money. Um, we've certainly been involved in a lot of appeals over the years. Uh, in relatively recent times, this was one of them uh, where the Art Fund came up with £500,000 but was deeply involved uh, in the raising of the... Uh, seven million remaining um, uh, pounds. There were sort of two phases to this campaign, a couple of years apart, due to reasons I don't need to go into. But it certainly uh, was one of those campaigns that a large number of the public seemed to remember in the UK and reminded people beyond the core art world of the possibility of the broad public becoming actively involved in helping to develop museum collections. Uh, this was a campaign that was run um, by the Art Fund in conjunction with the Tate for a very important uh, watercolour by uh, J.M.W. Turner, the Blue Rigi, a uh, very late important work uh, 
with an uh, extremely high price tag of nearly £5 million. Um, in this instance, the Art Fund um, came up with what turned out to be uh, really rather a, a brilliant uh, uh, device to encourage people to give, which was to suggest the notion that in, in giving a contribution to this work of art, it was the equivalent of buying a brush stroke. Imagine this work of art uh, divided up into hundreds of thousands of individual brush strokes by Turner, and the public were being invited nominally to, as it were, sponsor each of these brush strokes. And, and here we have a, <laughs> a picture of a young man who, holding two brushes, um, uh, he was someone that the press found who had donated the contents of his own savings collection, three pounds or whatever it was, to the purchase of, of the Blue Rigi. And although that's, it's sort of amusing and, and it's, it's a reminder, and I'll return to this later, it's a reminder that, that fundraising um, has to be an enjoyable process for all concerned, otherwise um, it's not likely to be successful. Sometimes you can use the threat of a bad thing happening to raise money. You can say, you know, if you're a, a, a health charity, you can say people will die if you don't give money, and that's one kind of incentive. If you're an arts charity, it's harder. You can say, well, this work will be exported, will leave these shores if you don't give money. But in arts fundraising, it's much better to come up with great creative uh, uh, sometimes amusing ways of becoming involved and participating in the process of fundraising. Um, and that seems to be a trend that's uh, increasing in importance. Here was another campaign that we ran in conjunction with the Tate. That was a, a, a much harder ask in terms of public taste, the, whereas the public uh, warmed very readily to uh, the appeal of Turner's Blue Rigi, uh, the more uh, complex art historical appeal of this sketch for the banqueting house ceiling in London um, was much heavier going and in the end the, um, uh, the final tally was made only um, on the intervention of, uh, of one or two major private funders. Uh, the Staffordshire hoard was a cache of Anglo-Saxon gold and other treasure that was found in a field in, in the West Midlands um, in 2009. And the art fund was helped to step, was asked to step in and help raise three million pounds, which was the value, the official value of the hoard, um, to prevent it being sold on the, on the open market. And this actually uh, created a huge, uh, I think it's no exaggeration to say, a, a real surge of, um, of public interest. Archaeology in Britain, thanks to one or two very popular television series, has become uh, a very fashionable subject. And we created a, uh, a supporting campaign that was very sort of populist. You know, we have just 13 weeks to raise 3.3 million to save the largest hoard of Anglo Saxon gold ever found, you know, join the campaign and so on. And, and it's about, you know, creating quite a high sort of emotional pitch. Um, I must say, it was in the experience of my colleagues at the Art Fund, one of the easiest campaigns that the Art Fund has ever been involved in, even though it was one of the largest sums of money um, that was raised. Uh, there was something about the idea of treasure dug up in a field uh, that seemed to capture people's imagination. And when the uh, works of the hoard had been acquired, finally, uh, we gave a grant of 300,000 and raised the rest. Um, when the uh, hoard finally went on display, it was you know, the subject of huge queues, as if it was a major blockbuster exhibition um, in its own right. Uh, another example of a public appeal, um, this time uh, for a very important work, uh, one of the seven sacraments in the collection of the Duke of Rutland in the UK by Nicholas Poussin. Um, uh, Extreme Unction, the last of the, of the series, um, made available for, uh, as a result of a special tax deal for um, uh, less than five million pounds, and the Art Fund was asked to work in conjunction with the Fitzwilliam um, to raise that money. And again, we uh, worked very closely with the media, increasingly a vital uh, component part in any successful fundraising campaign, of course. Um, and finally, the uh, sorry, you'll see the total cost there, 3.8 million after all the tax concessions, um, 
we gave a grant of 100,000, we raised 142,000 from um, our members, and then we worked with the Fitzwilliam to raise uh, the other sums from a variety uh, of, of trusts and foundations. But uh, again, quite austere subject matter, and we were very happily surprised that uh, a work of this kind, of this complexity really, could be presented in quite a populist way to attract um, uh, public support. We decided, um, in parallel with this campaign, to see whether we could make public fundraising for a contemporary work uh, a, su as a, a successful phenomenon, despite what I was saying about the views of some of our, our members, some of our more conservative supporters. Uh, the thirst for contemporary art in museums, in British museums, is, is uh, still very uh, active and developing. And we were asked to, by the National Maritime Museum in Greenwich, to help acquire this work um, by the British artist Yinka Shonabari, who's of West African uh, origin. Uh, and this was a work that was originally created for public display in Trafalgar Square in central London. Uh, where it sits, um, or it sat, I should say, underneath the shadow of Nelson's uh, column. And it shows the um, uh, flagship of Admiral Lord Nelson, a uh, famous figure at the beginning of the 19th century, um, uh, encased in a bottle in that part of a sort of maritime cliche of the, the ship in the bottle, uh, acting as a sort of light-hearted foil to the gravity of Nelson's column beside it. The Maritime Museum, when this uh, special commission reached the end of its time in central London, the Maritime Museum determined to try to acquire it for its own collection. And we became involved in a quite a high-profile campaign. We got the support of a... Uh, an advertising hoarding company, the people who control the posters um, in the commercial posters across the UK, and they gave us some um, posters for free, and we used that to, um, to run a, a text donating campaign. So you simply had to text the word SHIP to the number 70555, and your telephone bill would rise by five pounds and that five pounds would um, be given to, um, to the campaign. Now, believe me, this is the way of the future. <laughs> um, it, it, it didn't raise a huge amount of money in, this, in its first manifestation, but I'll get onto something in a moment that is a kind of extension uh, of, of this idea. Anyway, I'm very happy to say, and, and here I sh this is slightly the wrong way around because this shows the uh, ship in the bottle in its original location in Trafalgar Square, but the um, uh, acquisition was successfully made, um, again, due to the intervention of some wealthy backers at the last moment. But um, I think it was a sign to us that public campaigns, even for contemporary works of art, may have a life ahead of them. And I think, therefore, the job of managing the differing uh, tastes and, and wishes, um, the different, differing levels of adventurousness, if you like, amongst our supporters is simply... Uh, uh, something that we have to take on as part of the life of running a charity such as ourselves. Um, it's certainly true that our members do not spare, uh, spare us their opinions, and there is a very strong and developing tradition, I think, of people in the arts saying exactly what it is they want and what they don't want. Um, they often tell us what they don't want. They, uh, there is a case at the moment in Britain, which I won't go into in great detail, which involves... Uh, the Wedgwood Museum. Wedgwood, a very important uh, uh, manufacturer of porcelain from the 18th century onwards, uh, where there is a major collection that is under threat of sale on the open market. And the Art Fund has been lobbied by its members and by the wider public to intervene uh, as an agency to attempt to prevent this sale from happening, or if it does happen, to, to raise the money to buy it. Another instance here, uh, shown in this newspaper report is of a, uh, a famous uh, sculpture by uh, Henry Moore, which a local authority, a, a town council in London, um, believes it can sell off to help pay some of its social um, bills in the locality. And we are part of a campaign to trying to stop those, that, that happening. So there are two instances of the Art Fund responding to public pressure to try to intervene 
um, in an issue of, of arts politics. Um, when I talk about public pressure, look at the numbers of people involved. Um, over the last 10 years, the number of uh, uh, visitors to just the national museums, 17 national museums out of the 600 or so we have in the country, they are, of course, the major museums, but just in the space of a decade, um, the number of uh, people visiting or the number of visits to those museums has, has gone up from around 30 million to something like 44 million. So a pretty uh, significant increase. Um, uh, and as I say, it is accompanied uh, to some degree by um, a kind of rise in, 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 in people power in a, in, a, in a sense that the people who are consuming art in museums also uh, are uh, enfranchised to speak about what they about what they want. And our job, one of our challenges at the Art Fund, I think, is to know how far to follow the directives they give us in all respects uh, and how far to try to lead a new course. And I think one area where we've tried to lead a slightly independent course is to champion uh, the museums outside London, and, and not as a result of public pressure, but really as a result of us observing museums outside London going through very difficult times. Uh, local authority funding um, is uh, diminishing. Uh, no doubt, as here in Spain, there are cuts every year to museum budgets. And we at the Art Fund felt that there was a danger that the art world would become, or the, the treasures of, of Britain's museums would become pretty much concentrated in the capital as opposed to being more evenly spread. And so we began a few uh, initiatives deliberately targeted um, outside London. Um, one of those was called Art Fund International, which was a uh, incentive scheme to encourage museums to across the country to acquire international modern and contemporary art. So this was a fund of money, one million pounds was set up as a fund for on f in five different places. So five million pounds was made available to five different uh, museum partnerships outside London to build up international contemporary collections. And each of those five partnerships acquired about 30 works apiece, um, some very, very important works. I don't show the most important here, but simply a variety um, a collection of uh, film and photography by Ori Gerscht, uh, a very important artist who I think is going to become more and more famous in the years ahead, Ito Parada, acquired um, by Bristol uh, Museum and Art Gallery. Um, and I think that the, at the conclusion of that five-year scheme just last year, we felt that we had done something almost against the tide of taste and certainly not as a result of what people had asked us to do, to, to build up uh, contemporary collections uh, outside London. Uh, we've also been involved in supporting a rather remarkable project um, called Artist Rooms, which is uh, a project which began with the purchase um, of a huge, a, a simply huge collection of uh, very important international modern and contemporary art owned by the picture dealer Anthony Doffe, who over the years had built up an incomparably incomparably important collection. And he offered it to the nation. It's consisted of about 720 works. And he offered it to the nation, the Tate and the National Galleries of Scotland in partnership for uh, a sum of 25 million pounds against its valuation of uh, about, a, I think it was 126 and a half million pounds. So he offered it at the, reflecting the price that he'd paid for it. and. That was one of the very, very rare, rare instances in, in recent history in the UK where the government, the state, stepped in and made a grant to enable that purchase to go ahead. We too, the Art Fund, made a contribution of a million pounds, relatively small, but a large sum for us. Um, and that collection, that collection came into national ownership. And rather more excitedly, excitingly, I think, as a result of an Art Fund grant, the collection was taken out on tour around the UK in a series of very small sections. And this idea of artist rooms, the idea of a collection being made up of 
a series of rooms by individual artists. There are about 50 artists represented in this collection. And each one of those 50 rooms could be made available as a, a sort of mini exhibition to a museum somewhere in the country. Gilbert and George is another of the artists. Uh, Francesca Woodman, photographer, another. Um, and here, this just shows the current, this has been a four year tour, tour. This shows the current manifestation in 2013. And you can see on the screen the names of very small uh, museums around the country, museums that normally would not have the opportunity to show work of this uh, quality. Uh, and sometimes one of these exhibitions should, could just comprise four or six paintings, but they are of the highest quality. They come with all the uh, curatorial expertise of the Tate and the National Gallery of Scotland. They come with a sort of publicity package which the Art Fund is able to provide as well. And so, you know, bringing international contemporary art out from the traditional uh, locations in, in London particularly, but across the country, has been something that we've been very pleased to uh, participate in. Um, with all this public attention, um, all this public success, if you like, all this evidence of enthusiasm for art, perhaps particularly contemporary art, and there has been a revolution in the last 10 years, I think, in the UK, particularly in relation to, to contemporary art. It's now embraced readily by a very wide public, not just by the art world. There is a thirst for museums, a thirst for art of all kinds. The National Gallery in London is as successful as Tate Modern, so it's not just a contemporary thing. But to all that background, um, you know, I had to face when I arrived at the Art Fund the reality that the membership of the Art Fund was pretty stagnant. Um, it had been stuck, in fact, at a level of about 70 or 75,000 pounds for about 10 years. And so, despite all the rise in interest in art, despite the uh, willingness, as I've been describing, of people to make their views known and, and want to participate in art making decisions, the numbers of subscribers for the Art Fund seem to have, uh, have got stuck a little bit. And we certainly um, had many debates when I arrived at the Art Fund about the, you know, about the nature uh, of, of philanthropy and, and trying to ask ourselves really what it is that motivates people to give in different circumstances. And I think we came to the conclusion that the Art Fund's arguments to potential subscribers, to m people that it wanted to support it, had become a little bit out of date. And if you can imagine, if you can imagine the Art Fund as a shop, as a store, that used to put in its shop window uh, its product, and its product was the charitable cause. It used to say in its shop window, help save great art for museums in this country. It was a charitable message. Uh, enjoining the public to uh, uh, enter into a charitable act. And we would say, if you join us, you will become a member and then we will give you certain privileges and we will give you a, a card and the card will give you discounts and you will go and see exhibitions free and it will be great. But the main uh, uh, headline, if you like, was the charitable uh, act. And what we decided to do um, as a result of our analysis of some of the things I've been talking about this afternoon, was to reverse that proposition. And instead of putting the charitable cause in the window and having the membership card with all its discounts in the back that you got once you'd made the purchase, we changed things around and did it the other way. And we put the card in the window and we retitled the Art Fund membership card um, the National Art Pass. And we, with the help of an agency, designed a, um, a sort of emotive uh, message, never without art, to go on the back of the card. And we invited people to buy the National Art Pass. And that was in the shop window. If they bought the National Art Pass, we then said to them, aha, well, you also get a charitable cause with your, with your card. And so you are in if you like, uh, making a commercial decision to buy a pass which will give you discounts and free admissions, you are also helping uh, the plight of the museums. But, but you can be supporting us without necessarily having that charitable impulse as your principal 
motivator. And that simple um, act, which was backed up by a rather um, flamboyant uh, advertising campaign, um, and here's another example where we, uh, we uh, compare, <laughs> the, um, I don't know whether this translates in, into Spanish or not, but uh, the idea is that the National Art Pass is a very, very good deal, uh, and it's a, a way of consuming art at a very uh, competitive price. But that simple act of, of reprofiling, representing what we had always been doing, what we had always been giving for our public, had an immediate impact um, on our fortunes, and in a relatively uh, short space of time, um, and I should say that we um, also uh, created an app for people to download onto their smartphones, which created a guide to art everywhere in the UK. So we started providing a kind of promotional service for museums and galleries and exhibitions that's constantly updated, which ties in with our redesigned Website. So the Art Fund shifted some of its emphasis. Instead of telling people constantly about the Art Fund and all the good work it does in the world, it started to tell people where they could see great art across the country. And we now service our members, if you like, with an information uh, provision through the form of the arts, uh, through the form of the app, and through the form of the website. Um, and these, uh, and also there is a, a magazine, I should say, Art Quarterly, four times a year, people get a great art magazine as well. Um, the net effect of that uh, in, in just two years has been to put the membership up to, uh, I'm just, in fact, it is just over, I believe now, just over 100,000 last week, which in percentage terms is obviously a very significant rise, given that that has been achieved in a period of, of significant economic distress and austerity. Uh, and I think if a business had uh, been able to uh, increase its turnover by 25% in such a short time, uh, we would think that that was quite a remarkable phenomenon. So whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, by putting <laughs> the selfish interests of the uh, subscriber, the supporter, at the front of the uh, process of conversion, um, we seem to have uh, turned a corner. And I believe that um, our membership will continue to grow. There are very significant signs that despite this stagnation for a long time, that there is much growth potential left. Uh, we, for instance, recently offered, we did a special promo promotion with one of the British newspapers where we offered people a National Art Pass free for a month. And we had 50,000, 50,000 people in 48 hours applying for one of these passes free. And so those are now 50,000 people who we have their names and addresses and they are potential uh, members of the future. So uh, the need to uh, think laterally and to um, uh, be bold can... Um, uh, can pay great dividends. The net effect has been uh, a considerable increase uh, to our grant giving uh, potential. Here's an example of a commission uh, by a contemporary uh, sculptor, Rachel Whiteread, who you may know, who created this work with Art Fund support for the Whitechapel Gallery uh, uh, last year. Uh, we were able to give um, a very significant grant of 1.1 million pounds to the National Gallery in 2009 to help them acquire uh, the great Titian by Diana and Actian. But two years later, once we had launched the Art Pass and the new funds were coming in, we were able to afford £2 million to help the National Gallery acquire the partner work, Diana and, and, and Callisto. Um, and, you know, most recently, uh, a major work uh, long on loan to the National Gallery in London by John Constable, Salisbury Cathedral from the Meadows, one of the great um, uh, six-footers, uh, and indeed one of the most celebrated pictures in England, became available and was acquired once the National Gallery had um, stood aside by the Tate for a million, uh, for 24 million pounds with a grant from us for a million pounds. Now, interestingly, this uh, acquisition was made not simply um, as, a, as a sole acquisition by the Tate, but with the uh, encouragement of, of the funders, uh, 
it was um, it was acquired uh, in conjunction with four uh, other institutions around the country. So the National Museum of Scotland, the National Museum of Wales, the smaller Museum of Ipswich and Colchester, and the, and the uh, even smaller museum in Salisbury. So two small regional museums and two other national museums combined with Tate to make this acquisition. Uh, and this was, a, as I say, partly at the encouragement of the funders who felt that in providing such significant sums of money as this, that this was a work that needed to be shared and enjoyed by people around the country. And so for the next five years, this will work will actually be on tour around the country uh, spending time at each of those five locations and there is an agreement in perpetuity that the work will uh, uh, be displayed in those, in those four other locations beyond the Tate uh, as and when um, required. So an example, if you like, of, of, of people power um, having an impact on the way uh, an acquisition um, was made. I'm ending now... With, us, with a very light-hearted project that we've just embarked on, again with the Tate and one or two other partners. This is not a real arts project, but it's the next best thing. This is a project uh, that is going to happen in August to turn 50,000 billboard and poster sites. Now, these are the commercial poster sites um, that you see on every street corner. Um, and we have persuaded the poster industry to allow us to have all these poster sites for free for two weeks in August, which is a very slow period for them in commercial terms, make them over free, and we simply have to raise the money to uh, create the posters. And we've decided that we're going to draw attention to British art in public collections across the UK. Uh, and so the idea is that, you know, on bus stops, for example, um, you'll see a, um, a, a work of art... Um, uh, transported from the gallery wall uh, into a very public setting. Uh, and there's another example of, of, of how it will look. Um, we've chosen, uh, we being a small group of curators, have chosen a shortlist of 100 works of art. And we have invited the public, these have now been uh, made available on a special website, and we've invited the public to vote which of those 100 they would like to see on posters. And we've asked the public to help us reduce the 100 to 50. And by use of Facebook, people say which of the 100 they like. And we are currently counting up the likes. And when we finish that, um, we will have chosen the 50 works. And those 50 works will be turned into 50,000 posters across the country. Now, a normal major commercial advertising campaign would probably use 5,000 maybe three or 5,000 posters. This is 10 times as big as this. So this is about flooding, if you like, uh, the streets and far corners of the UK with images of British art, partly to continue to kindle this sense of engagement with great British works of art and, and works of art in British collections. But partly, I would admit, from a funder's point of view, um, it's a kind of experiment in fundraising because as well as getting the public to vote, we also need them to help us pay for this. We're not going to use our own funds, which we have reserved for real works of art. We're not going to use them for posters. So we've asked the public to help us pay. And we're using uh, a... And I'm afraid I'm, I really don't know whether this will translate into Spanish, but what we call in the UK crowdsourcing or crowdfunding, but a system of fundraising, which I'm sure some of you know of, whereby you use a website and you use a system of rewards. So you ask people to make a contribution to a cause and you give them some reward for doing so. And uh, if you... Uh, I don't know whether our translator is kindly able to translate some of the text on the right there, that we are... Uh, it explains what the project is and says that every three pounds you give will help convert a poster site into a British masterpiece. Donate £15 and you'll get your own bit of British art too. And in fact, the uh, rewards are um, take the form of a series of limited edition prints. There's an artist, Bob and Roberta Smith, who's created some work. Um, if you donate £450, that's about €500, Euros, you could even get a full-size billboard yourself. I don't know what you might do with it, but perhaps you might want it in your house or apartment. Um, and so far, we have raised, um, by this means, 
88,000 pounds. We have got a few other commercial sponsors who are coming in not in exchange for having their logos because the idea is that the posters will be very pure and will have no logos or will simply have the name of the artist um, and the name of the collection from which it comes and the image itself. Um, and I really wanted to, um, to end on, on that slightly light-hearted note um, as an example, if you, if you like, a, a very new and emerging kind of philanthropy. Crowdsourcing uh, does actually raise already billions of pounds around the world for, usually in quite small chunks, for charitable causes. And we are using this, we the Art Fund, are using this as a, as a bit of an experiment to see whether it might be uh, a means that we could adapt to the, our normal work of raising um, uh, money for works of art. So what are the motivations of mass philanthropy that uh, I've looked at today? Well, in the early days, it was certainly all about patriotism tinged with a little bit of, uh, of xenophobia. Um, in the case of the Staffordshire Hall, that Anglo-Saxon hall that I mentioned, um, the motivation seemed to be enthusiasm for archaeology that was, was very much driven and encouraged by the role of television and, uh, and, and the media. Um, I think the brushstroke campaign for the Blue Rigi, for the Tate, which people seemed so much to enjoy taking part in, is a reminder, the third point here, of the importance of the giving medium. You can't just ask for money, you have to ask for it in an engaging and perhaps original way. The lesson of the National Art Pass, the conversion of the old membership card into the National Art Pass and the huge impact that's had on our fortunes as a charity is a reminder that self-interest uh, is a very important component part of philanthropy and as a fundraiser you need to be clearly aware of that. And the final point, as evidenced by uh, the uh, light consumerism, if you like, of the crowdsourcing campaign around art everywhere, uh, the, the, the poster project, a reminder that that fun in fundraising um, is also uh, vital. Well, I hope that this survey of uh, what the Art Fund has been doing and is doing and might do in the future um, does have some relevance, and I apologise again if, it's, if it seemed to be a very English tale, uh, but I do hope it has some relevance to your consideration of some of these bigger um, issues of, of uh, public patronage uh, and the arts through this uh, excellent sounding course. So thank you for your attention.